I do not like feet. <laughs> do you? I mean, it's a pretty extreme example Jesus is making here. I mean, my wife's feet are lovely. Baby feet are cute, right? Little tiny baby feet. But once you can walk, I don't want to touch your foot ever, you know? <laughs> Especially man toes, right? The hair on top and that big long yellow toenail that sticks out and you're like, keep your shoes on, right? I mean, there's a reason we don't wash feet at church. I mean, have you ever had to do that? It, it's, it's a very uncomfortable situation to have to touch someone else's feet. It's, uh, there's, it's a closeness that we don't really experience with anyone unless it's like direct family uh, and even maybe not then so much, right? Uh, so this idea of foot washing that Jesus brings in is very intentionally uncomfortable and really just beyond what we would normally do. And Jesus is doing this as an example for us to remember and as this guideline for us to, to really execute into our lives. And so what I'd like to do is just take a little extra time to magnify that part of scripture that we read in John chapter 13 as it tells that story. Now you'll notice there was a gap of verses in there because it goes into a little theological trail that we're not gonna go into today. So we're gonna stick to the concept of the foot washing and the service. And one thing that's remarkable about this is you can tell that it was really a huge impact on the disciples because John, when he writes this, he really provides extra detail. How many times have you been reading in the Bible and you just see how it looks like they put like a hundred years into one verse, you know, and it's just like one verse and Jesus did this, you know, and you know, well, there's got to be a whole bunch of story to this, but all you're going to get is the one line. But in this you'll see that, that it really burned into John's mind because he describes it step by step by step and really gives a lot of detail that might not have been necessary to tell the story, but, but it, was, it was impactful, it was powerful. And so in John chapter 13, verse three through seven, it begins with the foundation of where Jesus' mind was when he started. And so we know that the Holy Spirit inspires scripture because there's no way for John to know what Jesus was thinking when he did his action, but that it's revealed to him in the scripture. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. So the mindset of Jesus when he's setting out to begin the foot washing is he's recognizing his place. He is from God, and he's going back to God, and he knows exactly who he is and what he's doing. The divinity of, of Christ was very much present at that moment in understanding who he was. You know, in the Gospels, we, we have this uh, dual part of Jesus, the, the Godship of Jesus, how he is God and the Son of God, and then you have the humanity of Jesus, how that he's a man, and he has uh, pain, and he has hunger, and he has all these things that go on in, in, in his life, and so you see the two of these exist simultaneously, and at this moment, he's saying, look, I'm God. I came from heaven. I'm going back to heaven, but I'm about to do this. And so he's really recognizing his authority, his position, his state, and using that as a platform to now become the servant. So the one who is the greatest, without a doubt, the one who needed to serve less or do less, or one who should be magnified, exalted, worshiped, and lifted up, is about to make himself the lowest in the room. He's gonna get on his hands and knees, He's gonna to touch disgusting feet. He's gonna show that that's something he is willing to do. Now, it goes from Jesus knowing that. The next line says, he laid aside his outer garment, taking on a towel, tied it around his waist. And so as a rabbi, he would have a coat, you know, and that would signify just like I wore a suit coat today. So you're like, oh, he must be preaching. He has a coat on. And he would lay it out aside. And it says he wrapped a towel. Now, in Jesus' gesture, this is essentially what he was doing. He was taking off that leadership symbol of the coat of the teacher. And then 
He's going to wrap up like a, like a servant, like a slave. Like he's here to wash feet and he wraps a towel around. Now, guess whether I wear this often at home or not. You can see. So he gets on his look. He changes completely their whole mindset. So as the disciples are watching, so here you have Jesus in his mind. I'm God, I'm from God, I'm going back to God. I am in the highest position. And he takes that coat off and he wraps on the towel. And see the impact that it has to John. John's watching each part and he's like, this is what he was thinking. And then he took off his coat and then he put on this apron. And then it says he went and he got uh, the pitcher of water and he's filling up the water. Look at all this detail. And he's filling up a bowl of water. And then he goes and he washes their feet. And it says, and, he, and then with their feet, he uses the towel that's around his waist and he's cleaning their feet. And then it goes back and touches him. <laughs> he's humbled himself to the lowest part. Now, think about what Jesus all the things that Jesus could have done here. Right, I wanted to eliminate the excuses that we have in our minds as we look at this. First of all, Jesus could have found the easier way to serve. I mean, they're at a dinner. Jesus could have set the table, right? He could have been like, you know what? I'm gonna put all the placemats out and I'm gonna put the plates out. He says, you know what? I'll help cook. You know, I'll make the hummus and I'll put out the pita. And I'll, he could have said, you know what? I'll pour the drinks, guys. Or he could have been like, hey, I'm the boss. I'll tell you guys how to do this. As Jesus, I'll be like, Peter, Andrew, you guys go get water. You know, Bartholomew, you put on the towel and you wash the feet. All right. He could have gone and directed or he could have said, hey, you six wash their feet and you six wash their feet. And then all the feet get clean, you know. He didn't do any of these lighter loads, easier ways to say, hey, you know what? I did something. But he says, I'm going to be the highest position. I'm going to come and I'm going to do the lowest job. And so he, he eliminates our excuses that sometimes we can say, well, you know what? I do something or I did this and, and other people could do things. And, and I'm kind of gifted at administration. So I'm good at telling people what to do, you know, and that's what I can do well. I'm a delegator, you know? Like all these things that we could place as our leadership. And what does he do? He goes and he does it. Now, another thing Jesus could have said was, I've already served enough. I mean, the very next day, Jesus is going to give his entire life, just completely physically allow himself to be beaten and killed. He is going to do the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate service. So why not on this day be like, hey, tomorrow's my day. Today, you guys wash some feet because I've got bigger things to do. I got something that no one else could do. Tomorrow, I'm gonna to save the world. I am gonna redeem all the world from its sins because I'm the only one who's perfect and can do this. And I'm gonna give my life as a sacrifice for many and I'm gonna save all these people. So you guys at least could wash the feet, right? That could have been Jesus' very justified and rational action because all that is true. And yet he says, I want to show what a leader does by getting down here and washing their feet. As he's doing this, it says, he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Peter's the greatest, right? Because Peter is vocal and honest and he does what we think and say so that he can get in trouble for it and then we could go like, oh, good. It was Peter, not me. But can you imagine how embarrassing it was when Jesus started washing their feet. Every one of them were like, I bet you I was supposed to do this. Why is Jesus down here at my feet? This should have been me. The embarrassment, it, it overwhelmed and the shame hit Peter. And he's like, whoa, 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 not, no, 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 no. This is too much. You're not gonna come and do this to me. And that's a section where Jesus teaches another lesson to them. But this this fear, uh, uh, this guilt that comes when we know we didn't do what we were supposed to do. It, it's real. It, it overwashes him. You, we call it like a fear of missing out when we know, oh man, we could have been there and could have done that. That's the FOMO. But this is Fonz. This is fear of not serving. All right. This is that feeling you get. I don't know if this has ever happened to anybody here 
where you sat at home all day, maybe watching movies or basketball, eating food, piling up, your house is a mess. Then your wife walks home and you're like, oh, uh, was I supposed to be doing something? And, you, and then they, you realize, oh no, I'm not supposed to sit here and do nothing all day. I was supposed to be a part of this family and help produce something. I was supposed to clean up my own mess. I was supposed to put my own laundry. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh no, that's, where, that's Peter at this moment. He's like, here I we were sitting around doing nothing. We were like, hey, we're at a party, we're at a supper, we're doing fine. And then when Jesus starts working, then it's like, ah, oh, we probably should have done something about this before he got on his hands and knees and had a towel and started cleaning my dirty feet. And so that feeling of, oh, I should have been doing this already. It overwashes Peter. But Jesus says, no, don't worry. This is something that I have to do as an example. And so he answered, he says, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterwards you will understand. And then when he washed their feet, it says he took off that towel and he put back on his outer garment. So he went back to his teacher position and he goes, so what did you guys learn here? And he starts to teach them. I feel like Mr. Rogers today. I'm gonna do my shoes next. He says, what did you learn? He says, what I'm doing you don't understand, but you will. And he says, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me the teacher and the Lord, and you're right. That's who I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, the next word he says, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So he visibly demonstrates it. And then he very directly makes a command. Right? This isn't a parable for them to figure out. He does it. And then he says, you need to do this. So point. Very clear in his communication. Very clear in the example he left. All of it is completely unmistakable. Unable to be confused. Jesus embodies the truth of what real power is, what real leadership is, is in serving. And so in this passage, you see the command to serve. He says, you need to do this. In this passage, you see the example to serve. Jesus does it himself. In this passage, you see there were no excuses. Jesus could have had a whole list of things to do instead of this. And yet he says, there are no excuses in this passage, you see the fear, the guilt that comes from not serving. But there's actually two more motivating factors to be obedient to this. And they might be better. The very next line that he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed are you if you do them. When, when we think of blessed or blessed, we, we often think of reward that comes to me that I didn't deserve, you know? Hashtag blessed, where you're, you're like, look at all this stuff that's happening to me and I don't deserve it, you know? That's our mentality of the idea of blessed, which isn't incorrect, it is part of it. But also whenever you see the word blessed in God's word, it's a complicated word that can get translated blessed and it can be translated as happy. Happy are you if you do them. Because what it's talking about is that there is a deeper happiness. Happiness can be fleeting. It could just be something, uh, entertainment, or that could enjoy you, that made me happy, that was happy, it made me smile, or whatever. It could be a cat video or whatever. But real happiness shows that there is something of greater value that has now been added into my life, and now I am blessed, and I have a deeper meaning and joy from it. And so he's saying, happy are you if you do this. In our pursuit of happiness, we usually just pursue consumption, right? We think happiness will be, be found in the more I could buy, or happiness can be found in more I could eat. Happiness is found in the more I could drink. Happiness can be found in the more I could do. What could I experience? What could I achieve? And we think the consumption will satisfy happiness. But what Jesus says very directly here is that happiness will be found when you find your place to serve. Happy are you if you do this. 
And so a greater motivation, even than the direct command, or even the example that Jesus clearly lays out, or even just the fear of being the guy who didn't do what he was supposed to do, is that if you want to find a way to enjoy your life and to enjoy God, you must find the place that you are to serve. I hope that we could remember a statement like this, that you will enjoy God more when you discover the joy of serving his children. That you will enjoy God more when you discover the joy of serving his children. In fact, this series that we've been talking about is about how to enjoy God, which as a church, we believe that this is what we were created to do. We were created to enjoy God and to live with him forever. That's one of the foundational faith, uh, doctrines of faith is that why were we created? To enjoy God and to be with him forever. And so how do you enjoy God? We talked about how we were all created to worship. We are made to worship. That we will worship something. And so if we don't find our worship in God, the only one who deserves it rightfully, then we'll constantly be disappointed in the idols we create and we'll worship all the wrong things and feel empty until we find that we can worship Christ and he fulfills us. And so we were made to worship. So we come and we gather to worship like we did earlier and like we continuously do because it it recalibrates our soul and reconnects us to God and who he is and how he's made us. Then last week, Avelio talked about walk with me, how that we were made to worship, but we're not just beings who are isolated with a creator, but that we are made in community with one another. And that all the commands in scripture of how we follow and obey God deal with how we love and treat one another. So we forgive one another, love one another, bear one another's burden, pray for one another, support one another. And so this is a a journey of life that you walk with me, that we walk together in groups and in friendships and in, in activities that we get to know each other and the difficulties that come from knowing the trueness of one another and then the joy that comes of learning to live like Christ and to love one another. And so we walk with me. And then the third thing is that you live out grace. And today that's what we're talking about. Live out grace is the phrase or the word that we use to describe finding that purpose that God has for you to serve in such a way that you can enjoy God now because you now understand why he's created you and why he's put you into this community because you see your purpose and your contribution into it. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 lay the theological foundation for live out grace. In order to live out grace, we understand these two things. Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10 is a great verse section for you to memorize. Because if you can memorize this and just lock it in your head, lock it in your heart, you're going to find that it's going to help you in understanding your, your own gospel experience, how you have come to Christ, and then understand why you have come to Christ because you are here to serve others. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one could boast. Our salvation comes as a gift from God. Jesus has already paid the price for your sins. You have been forgiven and redeemed, and now you are a child of God. You are no longer orphans, no longer slaves. You are heirs to the kingdom of of heaven, and you are children of God. That was a free gift bestowed upon you because of what Jesus has done. And so his grace has poured out onto you already and now you are full of the grace of God. This verse says there's nothing that we could do to brag about it. It's like you can't boast about where you were born or who you're related to or what you've done or how good you've been. It says because none of that brought you your position in Christ. He has bought you and he has done the work for you and now he has given himself freely as a gift to you and so now we sit into that grace enjoying it living in it and that grace is filling us up but then the final verse explains what we do with that it says for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus think of that word workmanship What's workmanship? Workmanship means something you make with your own hands, something that you create. It's a masterpiece. Does anybody here work with your own hand? Have you ever built something 
What happens when you build it? You feel like it's part of you. You feel like you love it. I made that. That's, that's mine. I created it. It could be a structure. If you're a builder and you build, if you're an architect and you plan it, you still feel like, oh, that's one of my buildings. I drew the plans for that. Even if you just lay the piping as an electrician, you still go, you know, I laid the piping at the, the Marlins Park. I heard a guy telling me that, you know, like he built the whole thing. And he was like one of a billion people who put a pipe somewhere. But because it was the work of his hands, he felt like that's mine. You know, I did that. It could be in that it could be if you're an artist in some way, if you write a song, if you write a poem, if you create something that gets published, that gets put out. You have a pride in it because you made it. It's yours. Maybe you've built a business and you struggle through that whole process and the imagination of it and, and investing in it and losing and winning and, and just going through all that struggle. What happens? You love it because it's yours and you made it. It's your workmanship. And so this verse says that you are God's workmanship. With his own hands and creativity, God created you and he loves you. He's like, I made that person. You are his. And so there's this, this bond, this affection that God has for you as what he has created with his own creativity, in his own image, with his own hand. You were made by him and for him. It says created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You see, we were made for a reason. It's just to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God knew when he made you that he had a plan for how you could participate in his kingdom. So the whole story of who, how you were built, the way that you are, your family of origin, the things that you've experienced in life, the success, the, the failures, the education, the opportunities, your personal makeup, all the things that create who you are. God's like, yeah, I put all that together so that you could do something with it. You could use it. He says, from the very foundation, I knew who you would be and I created a place for you to be a worker, for you to serve. And it says, you will enjoy God more when you understand your place of service in serving his children. See, because God loves his creation. God loves his, his creation. And so if you love God, then what happens is I inevitably now have to love his things, his people, his creation. And so God creates community and then he creates me to serve his community. And by that, I enjoy God more because now I'm related to the things that he loves and he enjoys. So you have a purpose and you were created for it. A couple weeks ago, I had the honor of attending a special breakfast that was put on by the Miami-Dade Corrections Facility. And they were honoring Lucy Hannaford, who is always here. You're two rows back, Lucy. You're back. <laughs> but Lucy was honored for over 30 years volunteering in the women's detention center, in the women's prison. Over 30 years. Can you imagine? That's a, a beautiful faithfulness and dedication to something to constantly do over, over, over. That's an amazing story. And it was so beautiful that the chaplains and the directors of the, of the thing were, were able to take a moment to honor Lucy for that. But that's an example of something that God is doing in this church in a many, many places. There's about 300 people who volunteer for activities here at Granada within the church and within our community partners. That's amazing. See, God is at work in people's lives. People are understanding that they will enjoy God more when they find a place to serve and that, that God has created you with the ability and with the opportunity to do that. And that when you go and you find your place to serve and you find your activity, you actually find that you enjoy God more because of that service. Now, I want to give you about four guidelines to think about because it's my desire that today that you will activate on this. 
that if you don't already have a place where you say, oh no, I serve at blank and this is my thing and I love it and it's my passion. If you're not clear to that, I want you to be that way. I want you to say, I'm going to find it. Because you'll enjoy God more when you discover the joy of serving his children. God has masterfully created you to show greatness through serving. The smallest act can make an eternal impact in someone's life. So here's some thoughts as you create and you set out on that. First, you do have a serving purpose. So you just need to know what it is. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 said that you were created for good works. So you have it. There's no way around it. There's not an exception to that. That was universal to everyone. That you have a serving purpose. So really all you need to do is find out what it is and do it. Now, a couple guidelines that might help you find it. First is opportunity. If God puts something in front of you, or into your life, or brings awareness to you, it's a good chance that you might need to serve in that. So think about what are your opportunities? What are the things that are around you that you have a connection to? Because opportunity is an important uh, thing to know. Then, from opportunity, add passion. What is it that moves your heart? What makes you angry or what makes you excited? What are you worried about? Or what do you see that, you, that needs to happen? So there'll be opportunities that show themselves all the time. And some of them you'll be like super interested in and others you will not be as much. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're an evil person because you didn't get a part of it. But God has put into you, your heart's going to tick on one of these. That's why we show different opportunities every week. Because everyone doesn't do the same thing all the time. And so there's going to be a new opportunity that you're going to go, that's, that's the one. Why? Because cause you feel it. Because God has put something in you. It might be from your past. It might be something that you particularly care about. But it's going to spark in there and your heart's going to move. And then you're going to know this is what God has for me. Because it's there and I feel it. And that's where God's going to direct me. Now, if you say, I don't feel anything, then just start trying stuff. Because God's going to move you into things. You try this, you try this, you try this, you try this. At some point, you're going to go, that's it. Now I understand. Now, that's the first tip. Second one, you don't have to serve everyone, but you do serve someone. One of the difficult parts about, you know, kind of having this global connectivity through, you know, our phones and internet is that you see every problem in the world all the time. And it's overwhelming, isn't it? It's overwhelming, all the tragedies that happen, all the things that happen. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do? You're not God. You're not going to save the world. Okay? So you do have to filter through all of the things that are happening and realize, well, what's the thing that God has put me in an opportunity to do something about? You can't do something about everything. Andy Stanley says this in a great line that is easy to remember. It says, do for one what you wish you could do for many. Problems could be overwhelming. Even the idea of foster care. Think about it. He said like 2,000 and something children are in foster care just in Miami-Dade County. And you're like, oh, I can't take 2,000 kids and change their life. You're like, that's a big, big problem that seems like so complicated. How are we going to solve that? You don't have to solve it. It says you do for one what you wish you could do for many. So you solve one thing. You take one child. You support one family. You give to one event. And you let God do what he does through the church that he has, people everywhere, all over the place. One of the most exciting, beautiful things we do here as a church is we host a lot of other organizations to meet here, like Explore Foster and Mission Increase. And we get to just listen to all these organizations that do amazing work in our city. And we realize God is doing a lot And we get to support where we can support and where we can't, we can't, but someone else will. But find the thing that God has for you. Don't get overwhelmed by all the things that you could do and do nothing. Just say, I'll pick one and I'll do it now and that's what I'll do. And if God wants to change it, he'll change it. But just start somewhere. The third thing, your serving purpose can change. All right, when you decide to start something, it doesn't mean the rest of your life that that's necessarily. Some people do that. 
They have like a passion for something and they do amazing things like Panos who has served so long in his ministry. Like Marty who created a school called Care has such a passion for that and then does it for a long time. Like Lucy, 30 years in the correction facility. But it's not always that way. Your life goes through seasons of change. If you have small children, your life is different than when you don't, isn't it? Babies and children take a lot of time, and that's your responsibility as a mother and a father to to care for your family and to do what what you need to do for your home. And so that might be a period of time where your service is maybe less time uh, control or you have to be from home or there's different rules that have to go around that, and that's what you do. But maybe when you're single, you have the freedom to do all kinds of stuff. If you apply your time and resource to it, You could do amazing things with the freedom that you have. Or maybe after a a different change of season when kids are older and not as dependent on you, now you have the freedom to go and to do more things and to find what God has for you. Life has seasons. Life has seasons of resource. There's times where you're scraping together just to get by and you can give some, but you can't give as much. And then there's times where God's blessed you so much where now you're able to resource someone. You're like, oh, I work and I make all this money, but I could pay for that someone else could do something that they have a passion for. And now you allow that and you unlock that resource because God's blessed you so much, now you're in a season of life where giving and empowering someone else becomes your gift. You see, it's okay, you have seasons of life, so just say, God, what do you have for me now? And take the opportunity and passion that's right before you and do that. Finally, your serving gives you as much joy as it gives them. And you you hear Jesus say that when he says, happy are you when you do this. Has anyone ever gone on like a missions trip? Usually this is the experience you have if you do a short-term missions trip a week or two weeks and you go somewhere. And the reason these are so powerful is because it takes you out of your life and out of your zone. And then usually you end up in somewhere that um, just has much less resource. It's usually a poor neighborhood that you end up traveling to and you're going to help orphans, you're going to help kids, or you're going to help a ministry or a church that doesn't have and you're going to go serve and build and you go there with this, you, you kind of set out for the, we're going to go and help them and you're, you know, you're ready to go after it and you're excited about it and then inevitably what happens to everyone is you realize you got so much more out of serving them than they got. You know, yeah, you you painted their wall or you built something or you took them things. But afterward, you just feel so amazing that you're like, you met these beautiful people and they had less than you and they were so generous and and you felt so great serving. And then you got to see how big God's church is that that even in other places, there's churches that love and care for you. And you begin to open your mind and you come back saying, that was amazing, that was so beautiful. My life was so blessed by going and doing that. Because inevitably, When you serve others, you end up getting more out of it. When Jesus says it's better to give than receive, he's not tricking you into something, right? It's not like a parent trick, you know? No, it is. When he says you're going to be happy when you serve, when Jesus is washing feet, right as a disciple, I don't know if I'd be that happy doing that. He says, no, you will. If you're able to lay down your life and find a purpose that God has created you for and involve yourself in it, you're going to enjoy God more when you discover the joy that comes from serving his children. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what a great leader you are. That you gave us the example of what it means to sacrifice yourself completely, to give your whole life so that we might live. To endure the the shame of sin so that we wouldn't have to carry that shame. To endure the separation from God so that we don't have to be separated. So God, you paid the ultimate for us. But then you lived in a way as an example. How is the most deserving leader to be a delegator and a director? Yet you said, I'm going to be the one that gets my hands dirty and gets on my knees and does the most your most necessary work. God, I pray that everyone here today will find that purpose. Many are serving already, and I just hope that in that, that they just are excited about it, that they don't feel like, oh, now I need to do something else. It's not meant to to be a heavy burden laid on more people, but God, 
in order to really enjoy you, we find the joy of serving you. So I pray that everyone finds their place and finds a great contentment in serving you. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.